Ephesians 3, 7 talks about the gift of the grace of God. And it is that grace that enables us both to deny what's wrong, to live for what's right, and to look for what's coming. Amen. You see, it's what he gives that gives us the right standing before God. And why does it have to be that way? Because of this. Acceptance is based on something that has to be perfect and without flaw. Amen. It can't be based on those high moments you have. you got to have high moments all the time if it's going to be based on what you do. And Galatians tells us that that's the case. As many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Isn't that a little presumptuous? I mean, maybe someone out there has done right and been good enough. No, it's not at all, is it? Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Huh? I mean, it's not just they have to do them all. They have to do them all continually. And yet we still have, coming from the pulpits of the land, a this do and thou shalt live gospel. Why? Because men don't understand the righteous requirement of God. Otherwise, they wouldn't go down that road. God requires flawlessness if you're going to be accepted. And I'm here to tell you, he's given it us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Perfectly flawless. Amen. Now, let's look at those that are in Christ Jesus that are not condemned. What about them? Something is said about them. It says that they walk not in the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, it's important that we understand why he said that. You understand where I'm at. There is therefore now no condemnation of them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Now, let's understand what Paul is not saying real quick. First off, he's not saying no condemnation is conditioned upon a person not walking in the flesh but in the spirit. I mean, to me, that's pretty evident. If there was a no condemnation in the flesh, then he wouldn't have delivered us from flesh. That seems pretty evident, but that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, now, this is the condition. This is the good news, but don't go too far with this. You walk in the flesh, you'll be condemned. That's not why that's there. That's not why that's there. This is, he's not talking about the source of our no condemnation. He's talking about the evidence. That's right. Amen. That is to say that having come into Christ Jesus, there's more to it than just that we're not condemned. We're actually changed in the process. Amen. See, We're actually changed. In fact, it is impossible to come into contact with the Savior and a union with Him without being changed. That's absolutely impossible. Amen. See, Let's look at some scriptures that highlight this, because this, this is a wonderful thing to see. If any man be in Christ, he should be. Huh? He should be. He is. He ought to be. We're trying. He is. And if he's not a new creation, it's because he's not in Christ. Huh? That's the way it is. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new, not will be. Are. What does that mean? It means the man's different. Totally different. Completely different. Here's another text. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See, when we came into contact with Jesus, we both died and lived. Died to the world, live to God. Amen. See, brother, it would be no more possible for a person to not be changed by being connected with Christ than it was for Jesus to stay in that tomb. Amen. There wasn't a personal change in Jesus, but there was a change in position. That third day, he came up. How can someone be connected to him and not come up? How can that be? It can't be, brethren. So if people aren't changed, the problem is they haven't been connected to Christ. That is the problem. Now, here's a piece of good news to see. What Christ produces in us, God does not condemn. Isn't that good? You see, he's making changes that God prefers. This is like the good pleasure of God's will that Jesus is doing in us, shaping us and molding us into something that pleases God. I'm glad that it's that way, aren't you? Hebrews 13 says it this way, The God of peace that brought again from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. See? And as we grow from glory to glory, we are becoming more pleasing to the Father. See, I know you want to be pleasing to the Father just like I want to be. It's good to know that in Christ Jesus, that is exactly what happens. Amen. See? That's what happens. Now, I want to get to this law of the spirit of life because this is where the Lord has really blessed me. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I just love the sound of that. Anything that's got life in it is going to be good. Anything that's got spirit in it is going to be good. See? Anything that's got Christ in it, that's, see, this is all good. This is all good. So let's look at this. This has become the true source of change. It wasn't a method. It was a law. Did you know we are actually under law? Boy, some of our legalist brethren will be very glad to hear me say this right now. We are under law. We really are. Or should I say the law is under us, upholding us. There is, of course, a distinction between that moral law of Moses and the law that is in our text. For example, one condemns and the other announces no condemnation. The law is referred to as the ministration of condemnation. In this one, the announcement is no condemnation. That's good news. One kills, the other gives life. The letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. One leaves men in their sin, the other takes it away. Both judicially and experientially. Amen. It is removed from God and experientially we are freed from it. We can actually say no to sin every day. See? Amen. One binds men into perpetual enslavement and the other gives them liberty. You can see they're definitely two different kinds of laws. Now, there are other laws that are like the law that's in our text that we find in the scriptures, and I just want to mention these. For example, Romans chapter 3 mentions the law of faith. We know that's not a moral law. The law of faith. It speaks of Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, announcing that great redemption that is in Christ Jesus... And he goes on to say that we are actually saved by virtue of our belief in Christ Jesus. And then makes this glorious announcement. Where is boasting then? Where is it? It is excluded. By what law? You better quit boasting. Thou shalt not boast. Is that the kind of law that's in this text? No. Nope. By the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude, we have seen this and perceived this, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Everybody who knows what's happened in redemption is unwilling to boast before God. Amen. We know that when he died, we were in weakness. We were without strength when he died. See? See? We were nothing but beggars. We were in the hand of God to do what he wanted, and if he had condemned us, it would have been just if that had been his desire. But he hasn't. What's turned the tide? What's made the difference? It wasn't what we did. It's that he bore his own arm and brought salvation to himself. And no man that sees that is willing to boast. So why do men boast against other men? Because they don't clearly see the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That's why they boast. You see, this